Good to go? Wonderful. Welcome, families of faith, and welcome to those of you listening online, joining us online. I don't know how your guys' week has been personally. I know some of you have had a very hard week. I've talk, spoke to many people this week who seem to all be struggling with the same issue. It's an issue that we should expect to come because we know God is on the move here at Families of Faith. Amen? We know God's on the move and he's reviving in us our old dead selves. Amen? Here's the thing we need to remember that anytime God is on the move, there's an adversary of God trying to disrupt what God is doing. And it seems like this week, many people in our body of families of faith have been struggling with this issue. So today I want to talk to you about a lion. Not the lion of Judah, a different lion, the lying lion. A lion is an ambush predator. That means it likes to stalk their prey. They like to look around at all the animals and look for the one that's not paying attention. They look, like to look for the weak, the tired, and the hurt animals that have wandered too far from the rest of the group. Lions are very smart. They avoid fatigue by staying in concealment. They wait patiently for their prey before la launching a sudden and overwhelming attack that in quickly incapacitates their prey. When a lion is hunting for its prey, they actually use their coats to blend into the tall grass. Now lions don't need camouflage to hide in fear of being attacked by a bigger animal. Lions use their camouflage so that they could sneak right up next to you and you'll never notice he's there before it's too late. Lions are extremely patient hunters. Lions can sit for several hours in the tall grass, not moving at all, waiting for its prey to carelessly walk closer and closer to it. Lions, while ferocious, are also smart, patient, and cunning. Lions are skilled, tactical killers. They don't simply just attack. They patiently, thoughtfully, and tactfully wait for the most opportune moment to strike. Even a lion's roar is tactical in the way they use it. It's meant to instill fear and paralyze the prey to give them an easier kill. Depending on the type of prey a lion hunts for, it hunts with different strategies. If it's a smaller, weaker animal, the lion will slim, simply come up to it and swipe its rear legs, tripping up the animal. But if the animal is stronger than the lion, the lion will stalk it over great distances, over time, in hopes to wear that animal out. But with whatever the prey be, lions are always looking for our weakness. 1 Peter 5.8 tells us, Be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, pours around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. I'm going to tell you that the way a lion hunts for its prey is the same way the devil hunts for his prey. Last week I told you how Monday nights, Pastor Randy has a class with the guys who were under Pastor Clark. I told you last week how awesome that meeting was. How a young man named Michael from a pest control company came in and he unexpectedly joined us in our Bible study. And how his mother's prayers down in Texas were answered. How exciting it was to see how God orchestrated all of these events and what amazing testimony it was to be able to be bear witness to. I was so excited last Monday that when I got home, I called Pastor John, and we talked about it, even though he was there and seen it unfold himself. After we got off the phone, 
I quickly opened my message and I added Michael's testimony to the message last week. I was so excited when we left our meeting last week because last week was an amazing time. This Monday, though, while still equally amazing because God can only do what God can do, was truthfully not, ex not as exciting as last Monday. This Monday, I walked into the meeting all excited. But as I was driving out of the parking lot and away from the, my herd, the lion seen a weakness in me and he pounced. Before I knew it, he had his teeth around my throat and he was slowly suffocating me. Far different than our previous Monday meeting. But I still say praise God because from it, came the message that he has for us today. Last week, Pastor Randy asked each of us to lead a class, and I volunteered to be first. I don't know what's wrong with me. Out of all the military experiences that I've brought with me to the walk with the Lord, somewhere I forgot the old military saying, never be the first one to volunteer. But I praise God for this message and how it came about. So anyways, I was the first one to volunteer. I put together an awesome message. My heart was fully in it. I used life examples and I had a purpose behind the message. The execution and topic were great. Pastor Randy said it was good and I could even use it for a sermon one day. But it was not delivered in the specific way he asked us to do it. Now, I want, I want to mind you real quick that Pastor Randy was completely patient, encouraging, and kind with me in the way he was saying these things. In all truthfulness, truthfulness believe it or not, Pastor Randy was much more, much more kinder than our beloved Pastor Clark was to me. That's a hard one to believe, isn't it? I'll never forget this. This was one of the first classes we had with Pastor Clark back in early 2019. He asked us to do something very similar. Well, with Pastor Clark, I got one paragraph in, and he stopped me. He said, let me see your notes. So I graciously handed to him. To them, to him. He looked at them, tore them up, and threw them in the garbage. It wasn't what he asked for. So yes, I could say Pastor Randy was definitely more kind. But in all honesty, so was Pastor Clark. He didn't do it with a mean bone in his body at all. Afterwards, Pastor Clark and I used to laugh over that moment, and we'd joke about it. And it was a great bonding moment for the both of us. Just like this moment last Monday was a great bonding moment for Pastor Randy and I. But like I said... The lion's attack didn't start right away when I was with everyone in class. After Pastor Randy explained what he was looking for, he continued to lead the class for the rest of the day. It was a great class. I took lots of notes, and next time around, I will hopefully get it right. But like I said a little bit ago, it was when I was leaving the parking lot in my vehicle when the devil seen a weakness and pounced. The devil seen a weakness in me that I almost forgot about, and that weakness is failure. Failure for me is not an option. For a time in my life, failure meant certain death. Failure has always been a huge disappointment to me, even if nobody else even noticed my failure. And that failure was the roar that the devil used to catch me off guard. He used my weakness to failure to catch me off guard and momentarily paralyze me. And then he used my mistake to sink his teeth in as he told me lies. He told me, you're stupid. You look like a fool. You're in over your head. God called this called you to this years ago and you didn't listen back then and now you think you could come along and try doing what he wanted you to do back then you missed the train you're wasting your time 
Nobody even responded to you. You're not making a difference at all. What are you doing with yourself? These are the thoughts that bombarded my head over and over and over. I didn't even want to go home. I drove around for 20 minutes around Shanahan. I came back to the church and sat in the parking lot for a few minutes crying. I drove around some more, the whole time being suffocated by the lies of the devil. I sat in my car. I stood on my driveway. I didn't know what to do. And eventually, the lion had to take a breath. For that moment, in that moment, I was able to cry out to God. And I said, God, if there's any truth in what I'm being told, let it be known, and I will stop doing everything I'm doing right now. But Lord, if you want me to be where I'm at today, then have Pastor Randy reach out to me to see if I'm okay. Well, after I prayed that prayer, I walked in my house, and the kids were playing. They were being the sweetest little kids I've ever seen in my life. I was literally in shock looking at my children and how well they were being to each other. What normally would make them mad at each other today had a different outcome. They were looking at each other and saying, no worries, brother, we'll do something different. No worries, sister, we'll do something different. It was unlike anything I've ever seen. I started praising God for what he has given me and thanking him and just being in awe of how awesome God is. And as I was in that moment, the phone rang, and it was Pastor Randy. And he said, Michael, I wanted to see if you're okay. Amen. Amen. 1 Peter 5.8 tells us to be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The lion looks for us when we are weak, when we are hurt, and when we're separated from the body. The lion looks for us when we are weak in faith. Not necessarily weak in our faith in who God is, but it's our weakness in who God says we are that we lack in faith. Think about it. God says that we could do all things through Christ who gives us strength. God says that we are his workmanship, created to produce good works. God says that we are a member of Christ's body, and a partaker of his promise. God says that we have been made complete in Christ, that we are redeemed and forgiven by the grace of Jesus Christ. But the adversary wants to say that we're stupid, that we're in over our head, that we don't know what we're doing. And even if that's the case, God says that's okay. Because if you lack wisdom... Ask for it, and he'll give it to you freely without finding fault. The adversary of God wants to tell us that we wasted too much time, that we didn't listen to God years ago, and that we missed the train. We can't come and join him where he's at work now. But God tells us that his calls are irrevocable. What he wanted from us back then, he still wants from us today. The devil likes to tell us that we're wasting our time, that nobody listens to us, nobody responds to our messages. You're not making a difference at all. What are you doing with your life? That's a straight-up lie. Not one, but two of my brothers said that even though it was in the wrong format, that they still got something out of it, that God equipped them with that they didn't have before. I let one mistake outweigh all of the good. At least two of my brothers got something out of it. Pastor Randy said it was good, and I have a message in the works. 
But truth be known, I was hurt. I was hurt because of my fear of failure, and I didn't do the task correctly. The lion looks for us when we're hurt, not just through physical pain, but also emotional pain. The adversary seen I was hurting, and he used that pain to bring lies into the mix. Hurting pain, whether it's physical or emotional, is like an open wound. When it's uncared for, it begins to rot and fester with infection. The infection that was rotting and festering in me was lies of the devil. In my case, which also may be very similar to yours today, it's very similar to many people I talked to this week that are in the body with us. The devil likes to tell us that we're stupid, that we look like fools, that we're in over our head, that we're wasting our time. We're not making a difference in this world. These are the things he told me. I became filled with all kinds of emotions and thoughts, and they only spread worse and worse. And then it started attacking other avenues in the truths that God has called me to be. And remember, this happened when I was leaving in my car. Because the devil looks for us when we're separated. Have you ever been doing something in your life and cut yourself and didn't even realize that you're bleeding? It wasn't until someone else brought it to your attention that you have blood on you. Maybe it was when you're shaving. Maybe it's when you're working around the house. We don't even know that we're wounded. Truthfully, I believe that's what happened to me last week. I could say at least I skinned my knee during the meeting and I didn't even realize it. But the lion smelt the blood. He crept up slowly and sl sl closer. And at the right moment, when I was separated from my brothers, he pounced. 1 Peter 5.8 tells us, be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. In the KJV, it says, instead of enemy, it says adversary. Make no doubt, the devil is our enemy. He's also our adversary. When this passage of scripture was written, the word adversary came from the Greek word antidikos, which was the prosecutor back then. He was the one who would bring formal charges to the judges in the Greek courts. And that's exactly how the devil is. He wants to remind us of our past. He wants to beat us up over our present shortcomings. And then he wants to add lies into the mix of them. Be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, pours around like a roaring lion seeking who it could devour. But verse 9 tells us, resist him. Stand firm in faith. Because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is under, undergoing the same kind of suffering. I know this is undergoing in our church. I've talked to several people that are experiencing the same thing this week. And some of you sitting here today and listening online are probably going through the same kind of experiences. God tells us to resist him. When I think of resisting the devil, there's only one example that we have. And that comes from Jesus himself. When the devil came and tried to tempt Jesus in the same way he tries to do to us, Jesus responded, Man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He replied two other times, it is also written. The devil likes to come with lies, but the word of God is the truth. If we stand on who God says, we know the truth. But if we believe the lies of the devil, we're going to fall into his trap. 
He likes to tell us that we're stupid, that we're fools, that we're in over our heads, that nobody cares about us, nobody listens to us, that we're not making a difference. Why are we wasting our time and all kinds of other things he throws on the plate? But let us stop and remember what God says about us. So if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Psalm 139. Because the truth is, the devil's going to throw all kinds of lies at us. But that's not the truth. The truth about us comes from God himself. In Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16, God says that he created us in our inmost being, that he knit us together in our mother's womb, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that we are his handiworks, and we are wonderful. That's us. We are wonderful, God says. In verse 15, it goes on to say that my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Nothing about us, about who we are, was hidden from God. God saw us in our unformed body, and he still knitted us together, knowing exactly how we were going to be. You hearing this? God made us, knowing we would be, knowing how we would be. And despite that, he still says we are his handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. That's who we are. God made you. He made us fearfully and wonderfully. He made us his handiwork for a specific purpose, for a specific mission. Don't believe the lies of the devil. You're more than perfect. You're exactly what God wanted and what God needs. God knows what he's doing. We don't. We don't know what he's doing at all. But when we look at his word and see who he tells us who we are, we're something special. We're something equipped something with a purpose. We're something with plans that God had for us long in advance. Long in advance. Long before we were even saved, God had a purpose for us. We need to stand on the truths of God and not the lies of the devil. The devil wants to bring up our past. He wants to accuse us of our shortcomings. And in the mix, he wants to throw all kinds of lies. And God says, no, I know every little thing about you. I know how I created you. And you are absolutely wonderful. You are fearfully made for his purpose. Entertaining the lies of the devil is a nasty place to be in your life. He attacks us when we're weak. Not weak in our faith in God, but weak in who God says we are. He attacks us when we're hurt. He uses lies and our past to bring up things that he knows hurts us. And for some reason, we entertain those lies instead of the truths of God. Usually it's because we're separated from the rest of the body. We're by ourselves. He sees us when we're weak and hurt and vulnerable. And he attacks like a coward. He waited until I was away from my brothers. Until I was by myself in a car driving away until he attacked me. 
He didn't do it when everybody else was around because he doesn't have the power like that. God tells us that we have the power to resist him. We need to remember who we are in God, who God says we are, and quit ignoring the lies of the devil. So as we close, I want to remind you, like I said last week, Midweek Connections, you have the ability and the responsibility from God to reach out to our brothers and sisters who are not here in fellowship with us today. They're not here. That means they're separated from the body. They're by themselves right now. Who knows what they're going through? I know they're hurt. We know that much. We know they're weak in faith right now. Not their faith in God, but in who God says they are. And we know they're separated, just like I was. Who knows? Maybe even one of them has been praying for a phone call, just like I was. But nobody's responded to God yet. The truth is, if God tugged on your heart last week to call someone, to go to someone's house and to reach out to them, and you didn't, that means that they're still sitting at home today, weak, hurt, and separated from the body. I couldn't imagine where I would be if Pastor Randy wasn't obedient to God and picked up the phone to see if I was okay. I was so ashamed of myself for listening to the lies of the devil that I didn't even have the incitement or the love to walk into my own house and see my family. I didn't even have the ability to go home. I drove around aimlessly, not knowing what to do. And I guarantee we have a brother or sister sitting at home right now feeling the same thing. And you have the ability to reach out to them and to bring them back to the herd. So Midweek Connections, this is your time. You know what it's about. You've heard it for years. You used to come to the altar. Why you stopped, I don't know. But God's altar is open for you now to come to ask him for forgiveness and to equip you to do the things he wanted you to do. But maybe you're somebody different. Maybe you're listening online right now and you're thinking to yourself, I've never been part of a herd. I've never been grafted into this love, this salvation that Jesus offers us. Maybe you're like a baby animal that was born in the wilderness and fell behind as the herd moved on. You're a strong animal. But your whole life, the devil's been stalking you, waiting for you to be tired so that he could devour you. The truth is, if you're tired of running away from the devil with no hope in sight, then now's your time to come to the Lord. Come to him and ask him for that salvation that he freely gives. After all, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So if you're somebody listening, whether it's today or 10 years from now, and you've been running your whole life knowing that the adversary of God has been chasing you, and you don't even know where you're going, but you're just fleeing, come to Jesus, all you who are weary and burdened, and he will give you rest. You'll find rest for that aching soul. Coming to Jesus, as important as it is, is no magical moment. 
It's a simple moment in your life where you realize who you are. You realize that the wages of sin is death. You realize that you have an adversary chasing you and there's no way out of it except through Jesus. All you have to do is come to Him in prayer. Ask Him to forgive you for who you are. And ask Him for that salvation that He freely gives. Stop running. Start resisting the devil. And be who God called you to be. Let us pray. Father God, I know your children are hurting. I know they're lost and they're separated. They're weak, Lord. And I know you've given us the responsibility and the ability to bring them back into the herd. Father, I just pray now that as you work on our hearts that we could get out of our way, out of your way, Lord, and do what you've told us to do. Father, I thank you for answering that prayer when I was calling out to you, asking you to show me the truth. Lord, I know others are calling for that same prayer. And I know for some of us, it's, it's contingent on us standing up and speaking the truths of God into their life. So, Father, I just ask, give us that willingness. Give us that boldness. Give us the words to say to go and rescue those who've fallen away. Father, we thank you for this time that you've given us on this earth. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your guidance and correction. We thank you from rescue, for you rescuing us, Lord, not just from salvation, but from the lies of the devil. Lord, I just pray for my brothers and sisters today that you continue to give them the strength to be who you called them to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray and give you thanks. Amen.